Uh, okay, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Um, please let me know if either my screen stopped the sharing because it sometimes tend to happen or something else is probably or, or if there are any question in general. Uh, in, in this mini course, what I want to do is to give you a relatively brief introduction to this uh, uh, theory of random simplicial complexes. Um, <clears throat> I feel that, just a second, uh, a field that came up relatively recently trying to generalize the theory of random graphs uh, to higher dimensions. Uh, we're going to have three talks in the first one. There's not going to be a lot of probability, just an introduction to the models, to the um, how to generalize things in, in phenomena and random graphs and sort of common language to deal with simplicial complexes. And then in the other two talks, we're going to look more into uh, specific models and what should be considered the fundamental result that exists to date. Uh, so I, tried, I will try to give you some overview on the field. Um, okay. So, okay. So as I mentioned, this, this theory is, is a sort of generalization of, of the theory of random graphs and random graphs have been here for uh, roughly 60 years, uh, starting by, by the work of Erdish and Rennie and at the same time also Gilbert and 59. Um, and the, the theory of random graph by now is, is very well developed with a lot of interesting models and interesting theorems and, and um, it's a combination of many, many areas of mathematics and also a lot of applications and mainly in the analysis of networks, connectivity and so on in, in all kinds of networks, whether it's a computer network, social networks, uh, biological networks and so on. Uh, there are also some applications in, in machine learning uh, well, trying to recover some structure underlying data, uh, also in statistical physics, modeling on kinds of models and probably many other applications. So it's a pretty big field. Um, what's, we will talk a little bit about random graphs in, the, in this uh, course, uh, but the main goal is to go from graphs to simplicial complexes. So we'll get to the formal definitions later, but the idea of simplicial complex is to take a graph that has vertices and edges and include also triangles, tetrahedra and higher dimensional simplexes in this structure to get something which is of a higher dimension, uh, which means that we have more objects to work with, more randomness possibly, and also more phenomena um, to explore. Uh, there also recently um, coming up, showing up all kinds of applications to these models as well. Uh, one area is still within the, the, the realm of uh, networks where you can think about, so a graph can model interactions in network between two nodes at a time, telling you how each agents in, in a network can connect, uh, but you might conceive networks where you want to in include information about uh, the interaction between three, four, five or more agents at the same time and say how this group of agents is communicating. And then you can introduce a simplicial complex or a weighted simplicial complex to have this information. Uh, and another area which um, uh, is also uh, growing uh, over the past 10, 15 years is called topological data analysis, where uh, simplicial complexes are sort of used to extract interesting information from data to extract all kinds of features that might tell us something about um, all kinds of phenomena that we, we can um, recover from the data and say something about in, and use it in machine learning or statistics and so on. We're not going to talk about applications anyway. Um, this area is much younger. So probably the first uh, work is by Linian and Mishulam from 2006. So it's up uh, around 15 years. Um, okay. So in this talk, my main goal is to get to the point where I can um, clearly describe to you what kind of models we want to study and what kind of phenomena we want to study on these models. So, and it will start again with, with models of random graphs. So probably the most well-known and well-studied models is the GNP random graph, uh, sometimes uh, related to Erdős and Renyo, even though their original paper was the, the uniform random graph, which is slightly different, but those models are, are very similar. Um, so here, what we do is we start with N vertices and then each edge can be added randomly independently with a fixed probability P. Uh, and so we get a graph that looks like that. We have just N vertices and each connection can appear or not appear with 
the fixed probability P. If we ask what is the degree of a given vertex, so each vertex can connect to each of the other n minus one vertices with probability P. So we get a binomial distribution for the degree. And the nice thing about this model is that it's very simple to describe. And also the analysis is relatively clean and, and, and it's a nice model to work with. And therefore probably uh, this model has the most uh, well-established uh, theory and, and results around it. Uh, one drawback of this model is that in terms of real world networks and application, it's, it's not very realistic because everything there is independent. There is no structure, there is no bias towards clustering or any other, any other kind of phenomena that uh, appear often in networks, uh, small world network and so on. And therefore there are many other models for random graphs which try to, to introduce some dependence or some structure to it. Uh, there was only one model, another model that we we're going to consider in this uh, series of talks, uh, which is in that direction in a way, which is the geometric random graph. Um, introduced here. So in the random geometric graph, what we do is um, the randomness is in the vertices. So each vertex is generated by a Poisson process on some metric space. And uh, we will assume that it's an isomogeneous Poisson process, even though it doesn't have to be. And then the connection between the vertices is determined by the distance. So if two vertices are close enough, so the distance is less than some value r, then we add the edge, otherwise we don't. Uh, and then, for example, if I sample points from the annulus, I see I can see a graph that looks like that. So there's more structure here and more dependence between the edges that we don't have in the addition running. Uh, here, just a comment, if, if I know that there is a vertex at some location x, then uh, in order to determine which are, how many neighbors it has, what it is the degree, I need to look at the neighborhood around this vertex and ask how many points I have there. So from the properties of the Poisson process, I know that this, the degree then has a Poisson distribution and the parameter of the distribution would be proportional to the volume or the, and, uh, the measure, probability measure on this, on the ball around the point. Uh, so this model is also very nice to work with, uh, especially because of the spatial independence of the Poisson process. Uh, and these are the two models that uh, we will later generalize to higher dimensions, and, and I'll tell you what, what is known about those. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are many, many other random graph models that uh, have been more or less studied. Uh, there is the uniform random graph, the original erudition Rennie model, the in a homogeneous random graph for uh, different edges might have different probabilities. There are regular random graphs, uh, percolation models. In essence, there are also some kinds of random graphs, whether it's on a lattice or, or some other model. Uh, and there are more, the, the, these three are more realistic models uh, in a way, the nearest neighbors, the prof professional attachments, small world. These are models that try to mimic more of a real world networks. Uh, but often the more realistic the, net, the model is, the harder it is to analyze. Uh, and I believe that the, the GMP is sort of the, the nicest to work with in terms of at least mathematics and proofs and so on. Um, but again, there are many, many other models as well. Um, what kind of topics do people care about when studying random graphs? So again, the list is quite long. You can look at the degree distribution uh, of the vertices in the graph. You can look for the appearances of subgraphs. You can look at the size, the diameter, the longest path, the longest cycle, uh, and so on. Uh, there's a long list here. Um, in this mini course, what we want to do is to take properties uh, that people care about in random graphs and try to study them in higher dimensions. Uh, and in particular, we will uh, generalize things like uh, connectivity, uh, the appearance of cycles and the appearance of giant components for collation related phenomena. So we'll talk about this kind of phenomena in higher dimensions. Uh, using simplicial complexes, there have all, also been um, some work on uh, the equivalence of spanning trees in higher dimension, uh, some analysis of uh, higher dimensional spectrum, and also looking at uh, random walks on, not on random graphs, but on random simplicial complexes. So uh, many of these phenomena can be generalized to higher dimensions. So it's, it opens a, a door to a whole new interesting uh, uh, field that, uh, again, I would try to introduce here. Uh, please stop me or slow, slow me down if there are any questions. Um, so the main object we're gonna work with instead of a graph, as I mentioned earlier, is the simplicial complex. So now I wanna just give you the, the formal definition. 
So we will look at what is called an abstract simplicial complex, which is constructed as follows. You start with some set, uh, doesn't have to be anything specific. And then the complex is a collection of finite subsets, not empty subsets. And the only requirement is that this set is uh, closed to taking subsets. So if you know that A is in your collection and B is a subset of A, then necessarily B is also in, the, uh, in this collection. And visually speaking, if you think about it as a collection of vertices, edges, and so on, it means that if you have a triangle like in the picture here, you, you must also include the uh, edges of the triangles and the vertices of the triangle. So it goes down, you have to include all the simplexes downwards. So this is an abstract simplicial complex. And you can see an example here on a set of uh, four vertices, A, B, C, D. So this is S. And then we make a list of what are the simplexes. Usually we denote simplexes with uh, square brackets, like here. So we have vertices A, B, C, D, and those will be referred to as zero dimensional simplexes. We have edges, which is the list here, one dimensional simplexes. And in this example, there's also this two dimensional face or triangle which is a two-dimensional simplex. Um, okay, um, so this is the kind of object, but again, it can go higher than dimension. We have three, four, five simplexes and so on. Um, okay, a little bit, some notation that I'm gonna use later. Uh, usually I'm gonna refer to simplexes either using um, sigma or tau. Um, if the number of elements in sigma in a simplex is k plus one, then we say that we have a k-dimensional simplex or k-dimensional face. Um, when we say that tau is a face of uh, sigma, what we mean by that is that it's a subset of it, but it's a subset of co-dimension one. So it's one dimension lower. So an edge is a face of a triangle, a triangle is a face of tetrahedron and so on. And we will denote it by the um, less than sign. So we say tau is less than sigma. Um, with superscript k, we denote the set of all k-dimensional simplexes in this collection, in this complex. And with brackets, uh, it's the collection of all the simplexes from dimension zero to k, uh, and which is a simplicial complex, which is just called the k-skeleton of our complex. So we sort of chop it and remove everything of dimension higher than k. Okay. So th these are the objects that we're going to work with. Instead of graphs, you know, we're going to look at these objects, which just include more information than you have in a graph. And now um, the next thing to do is uh, to try to formalize some kind of a language that will help us to take phenomena that have been studied for graph and random graphs and um, find equivalent or uh, analog behavior in, in those higher dimensional complexes. And it turns out that, um, algebraic topology and specifically homology theory within it uh, is a great tool or a great framework to, to, to work with and, and to generalize phenomena from graphs to those simplicial complexes. And that's the next thing I wanna tell you about um, now. Uh, so we will focus on something which is called simplicial homology and cohomology. I will try to, this is a whole huge field in, in, in algebraic topology. I will try just to give you the, the essence of it uh, as intuitively as I can. Um, the idea is to take phenomena like connected components and cycles that can appear in graph and look for things in, that are similar but in higher dimensions. And let's start with a one-dimensional example. So we're still within the context of a graph. Um, and the question I want to ask is how many components does this graph have? Um, and I want to argue that there are possibly two approaches, maybe, maybe more, but two approaches to, to answer this question. One approach would be, I call it a structural way, in which what I do is the following. Um, what I do is I take every vertex and for every vertex I define an equivalence class, which contains all, everywhere that I can get from uh, using a path if I leave the vertex V. So all the vertices that are connected to it by a path. So this would be the, the, the equivalence class of V. And then what I wanna ask is how many classes overall do I have in my graph? Okay. So in the example above, um, I have the class of the vertex A, which includes B and C as well. I have the second class of D and the third class of F. So overall, in this example, I have um, three classes. And if I know that there are three classes, then I know that there are three components. Okay. So um, this is what I consider the structural way to, 
answer this question. And later on, we're gonna call this approach uh, homology. Uh, here is another approach of finding out information about how many components we have. And this is by, I call it a functional way. Uh, and here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the space. It's a linear space of all uh, functions on the vertices. So I define a value for each vertex, that's a function. And I'm looking for functions which are piecewise constant um, and continuous. So continuous means that I am, um, I'm not allowing the value to change uh, between two vertices of the same edge. And then I wanna ask what is the dimension of this linear space? And for this example over here, uh, I hope it's, it's clear to see that, for example, um, if I put two, um, or if I take the function, which is one, 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 and zero everywhere else, this is a piecewise constant function. And if I take a, but I have another function, which will give me where I have ones here and ones here, and those are independent functions. And therefore I have, um, and all those, the combination of those would also give me a, uh, piecewise constant function. Therefore, I have a, a linear space which has a dimension three. The basis includes three um, three functions, uh, which is again the number of components. If I have more components, then the dimension will grow up. Every component basically gives me another uh, possible basis function, uh, which is piecewise constant. So these are two approaches, and this second approach, which is I call functional, later on we'll call it the cohomology. So this, in a way, it's not it's not completely accurate to say, but homology and cohomology are trying to study uh, these kinds of phenomena by looking at things either structurally or functionally. Um, so this is the main idea. Now I wanna to introduce to you the uh, homology and cohomology themselves, which means that we're gonna go up in abstract simplicial complexes setting. Uh, just a remark. Um, so, so we're gonna use we're gonna to move to linear algebra now. Uh, we're gonna do our linear algebra using uh, coefficients in Z mode two. So everything is just zeros and ones. Uh, generally, homology can be defined for much um, larger classes of coefficients, but in order to keep things simple, we'll do uh, Z mode two coefficients. Okay. And we'll start with defining homology. So this is the structural version. Um, and the fundamental object is uh, I'm going to call it CK, which is basically I'm taking uh, copies of Z2, as many as uh, the number of simplexes that I have in dimension K. I'm going to call this uh, the space of K chains, which basically you think about it, it's a list of zeros and ones that tells me which simplex is included in this list and which isn't. So you can think of it just as a list of simplexes um, from my big complex uh, using the zeros and ones. Now, um, so I have, I have C1, C0 for the vertices, C1 for the edges, C2 for the triangles and so on. And the connection between um, uh, the simplexes in different dimension is done by what is called the boundary matrix or the boundary operator. What the boundary operators tell us is uh, which uh, simplexes are on the boundary of which other simplexes. And it's done in the following way. Um, so suppose that XK, this is the list of all uh, k-dimensional simplexes in my complex. And this is the list of all k minus one dimensional simplexes. So I'm defining uh, this matrix, I'm calling a partial k, this is the boundary matrix. So it's a matrix of zeros and ones, and its dimension is uh, m times n. And what this matrix, matrix contains is it contains one for all those cases where tau i is a face of sigma j. So whenever something is on the boundary of another simplex, I'm gonna put a one, otherwise I'm gonna put a zero. And this gives me all the information that I need to go from simplexes in dimension K to the boundary in dimension K minus one, and then to that, the boundary of those in dimension K minus two and so on. So it gives a sequence of connections between the different dimensions. Uh, we cannot think of it as an operator from those lists of simplexes in dimension K to lists of simplexes in dimension K minus one. So it's not only telling us what is the boundary of a single simplex, but also what is the boundary of a collection of simplexes. And so here's an example. Suppose that I have an edge on the left. Uh, so the boundary of a single edge will be what you consider as the boundary will be the two vertices, the left and the right. Uh, if I have a chain, which is a list of uh, two edges like here, 
then the boundary of this thing uh, will also be the two vertices. Um, in principle, there also should have been one vertex here coming from the left edge and one vertex here coming from the right uh, vert edge. But since we're working with Z mod two coefficients, once I'm going to sum them together, they're going to cancel each other. So um, this is going to disappear, and the boundary of basically the boundary of a path are the two versus the two endpoints, which is again what we intuitively think of it when we say boundary. So this is in dimension um, one. The boundary in dimension two, so if we take a, a triangle, the boundary is going to be um, the three edges, the three sides of the, of the triangle. OK? And similarly, if I take two triangles and glue them together, so I get a square, uh, again, the edge in the middle that connect them will be canceled because it's going to be going to appear twice. And therefore, the boundary of this object is going to be the square, the four edges up. So, um, so this boundary operator gives you something which is very intuitive in, in the sense of the structure. Um, the boundary of a two-dimensional shape is the actual one-dimensional boundary. The boundary of a path is the two endpoints and so on. Uh, to make things complete, we're going to define the boundary of vertices, the zero dimensional boundary, to be zero. So once you take the, um, the boundary of the vertex, you're left with nothing. Okay. So we have those chains, which are a list of simplexes, and we have this boundary operator, which connects simplexes in different dimensions. Um, <clears throat> and now we're going to define a few things using uh, just linear algebra. So we're going to define this space ZK, which is the kernel of the boundary operator. Uh, we're going to call this the, the space of K cycles. What do we mean by that? It's basically all the chains, all the list of simplexes that do not have a boundary. Right? So you can think about um, a true cycle. right? If you, take, if you think about what is the boundary of a cycle, there is no boundary because there are no uh, two endpoints. The two endpoints sort of glued together. Um, but this is more general. We can define this idea of cycles in, in any dimension, and it's just the kernel of this matrix. Uh, we can also define the image of the uh, boundary in dimension k plus one, which is all the list of k simplexes that are a boundary of something else. So this we're going to call bk. Uh, another thing we're going to need is uh, we're going to say that two, so these are two chains, let me lists of edges or lists of uh, triangles and so on. I'm going to say that they are homologous or equivalent like here if when I sort of glue them together so I take the sum of those two as vectors uh, if this thing bounds something else in higher dimension so for example if this is a path in my complex and this is another path in my complex that I can glue together on the endpoints um, if the region between them is empty like the picture is right now then they are not homologous but if there is something of dimension two enough triangles inside that sort of fill in this whole area, then I'm going to say that gamma 1 and gamma 2 are homologous. So if they bound some two-dimensional shape, they're going to be considered equivalent. And the reason I'm telling you that is because next what we're going to do is we're going to look at equivalence classes. So we're not going to care about individual cycles or chains. We're going to care about them only within uh, the same equivalence class where two chains or two cycles are uh, homologous if they sort of uh, they bound some higher dimensional shape. Uh, now, sort of the key property that facilitates uh, the definition of homology, which will come in a second, is the, the following. If I take this boundary operator and I apply it twice, so let's say I take triangles, I some list of triangles, I apply the boundary, I get a list of edges, I apply it again, I get a list of vertices, this is always going to be empty or the, it's always going to be zero. And you can see an example here, if I take a triangle, the boundary are the three edges. And if I take the boundary of the three edges, I'm left with nothing because that's a closed path. It has no boundary. OK? Or in other words, uh, this space of boundaries that I call it BK, every boundary is also a cycle. A cycle, namely, it's, um, uh, it's in the kernel of the operator. Uh, so, And it's a relatively simple uh, linear um, property to check. OK, so now we can uh, finally formally define what is homology. Uh, I gave you the name before, but now the case homology in the, in the literature, it's called the homology group because it's, a, it's done in a more general context where 
the coefficient can be different, but we'll just call it the case homology. It's the quotient linear space. So you take the space of all the cycles, everything that doesn't have a boundary, and you quotient out everything which is a boundary of something of higher dimension, which effectively what you do is you take, you take all the cycles, but you look at them grouped together according to the equivalence classes where two homologous cycles are, will be sitting together. Um, I'll give you an example in a second, uh, just two comments for now. Um, the equivalence class of zero is this space BK, everything which is a boundary, if you add to it, um, if you add it to the zero chain, then it's still a boundary. Um, and the dimension of this linear space is the difference between the dimension of the cycles minus the boundaries. And this thing is called the kth Betty number. We will use beta k to, to denote it. Um, so uh, this is very briefly what homology is. Uh, I gave it to you as a linear algebra definition. What I want to do next is, by example, show you what this homology actually mean, what does it measure? Uh, any question before we go to the example? So here are the same simplicial complex we had before. So we have um, four vertices, we have five edges and one triangle. Um, and here are the boundary matrices, right? So we said that the boundary, the zero boundary is always zero. So what we have here is a this is the boundary of the vertex A, this is the boundary of the vertex B, C, and D. Um, the boundary in dimension one basically gives me the boundaries of all the edges. So I have um, here, this is the boundary of E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and the boundaries are vertices. So for example, if you take, I don't know, E2, this edge, its boundary should consist of B and C. And indeed, if you go to the line here, the column, then this column corresponds to E2, and you see that B and C are the vertices on this, uh, on the boundary of this edge. So this is the information on the boundary of edges. And finally, you also have one simplex, so you can write down the boundary operator for that. So this is sigma over here, and um, here are the list of edges. So this boundary matrix tells us that the boundary of this triangle consists of E1, E2, and E3, as you can see here. So these are the boundary operators. And now in order to determine what is the homology, we need to calculate all the uh, kernels and images of these transformations. Um, <clears throat> so um, the kernels, uh, um, Sorry, the zero boundary operator, as I told you, is always zero. So the kernel is everything, basically. Uh, B0 is the image of the uh, boundary in dimension one. And um, you can basically, uh, it's the, uh, the span of this space. But um, I believe uh, this vector here is the sum of these two. So it doesn't, we don't need it for the basis. So basically, there are four basis elements here. Okay, So this is B0, and now H0. Uh, you get it by taking the quotient of everything quotient by this four dimensional space. And what you get is a one dimensional space where um, an element of it, you can consider it as the equivalence class of the vertex A by which I mean the vector one, zero, zero, zero. So this vector is a, a one dimensional cycle, which is not a boundary of anything else. And its equivalence class spans the entire homology. That's everything we have. And overall, we get a, a linear space with two elements. This will be the zeroth element, and this will be the one element. So we get something which is uh, isomorphic, again, to, to Z mod two. So it's a very simple space. Uh, what does this thing measure? In fact, if you had a more connected component, then you have one class for each component, very much like the example I started with. You have an equivalence class for every vertex. and Essentially, beta zero, the dimension of this thing, is the number of uh, components that you have in your complex. This is always true. In this case, there was only one component. So it's a one dimension thing. OK, so we find a sort of a little bit complicated algebraic way to get to counting components. But the power of this thing is that it goes higher to higher dimensions. And let's see how. Um, 
So now I want to look at the one-dimensional homology, and I will be looking at uh, Z1. So Z1 is the kernel of uh, the one-dimensional boundary operator. Uh, it appears here. And if you check, you can see that uh, the kernel of this thing is spanned by these two vectors. So basically, 1, 1, 1 here, or 1, 1, 1 here, or there's some. Okay. Uh, what does those two represent? So uh, gamma 1 is basically the list of these uh, three edges, and gamma 2 is the list of those, those three edges. So this would be gamma 1, and this is gamma 2. And indeed, those are two clo closed loop without, without a boundary. So we have either the yellow triangle or the blue one or the, the, the sum, which is going to which is going to be the the square. So these are all the possible uh, one cycles. Now the boundary uh, B one is everything which is a boundary of something of higher dimension. In this case, only gamma one, right? Because gamma one is on the boundary of the simplex sigma. Gamma lambda uh, gamma two is not on the boundary of anything. The region is empty over. And then when we take the quotient, basically we just cancel uh, gamma one and we are left with the equivalence class of gamma two. So again, we get something which has only two elements, it's equivalent to Z mod two. But now what it measures is something different. It measures the number of, so to speak, holes that we have in the space, right? Because we have, um, essentially we have two closed loops, but one of them is a hole. You can uh, put something in the middle. The other one is covered by the simplex, so it's not a hole. And Overall, if you have a bigger space, you can see that the better one, what it measures is um, the number of holes. Okay, and you can think about holes as closed loop where the interior is not included. Um, so this is roughly what homology tries to measure. So it's connected component in dimension zero, uh, holes in dimension one. In dimension two, it's gonna be sort of air pockets or bubble, two dimensional closed surfaces. And generally in higher dimensions, uh, a K cycle will be, um, we think about it as a K dimensional hole, something, something which is a boundary of K plus one dimensional object. And beta K for us will be the number of uh, K dimensional holes. So this is what homology gives us in a way which is purely algebraic, but uh, it gives us something structural, some structural information about our, uh, in this case, combinatorial object. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so as I told you before that, uh, I'm gonna consider two approaches. That was the structural way. We look at lists of simplexes and from that we find the, the, the cycles and so on. Uh, the cohomology way is a functional way to sort of look at the same information. Uh, it's not exactly, but for us, uh, we can assume it's the same. Here, what we do, instead of thinking of um, lists of simplexes, we're gonna think of functions on the simplexes. So uh, everything now is gonna be with superscript K instead of subscript. And we're gonna think of functions from K simplexes to Z mod two. And those are gonna be called co-chains. Uh, the operator we have here, it's called the co-boundary operator, uh, which it's basically the transpose matrix of uh, the boundary we had before. And you can think of it as an operator taking us from function on K simplexes uh, to functions on K plus one simplexes. So it goes in the other direction as before. Before we went down dimension, now we go up in dimension. Um, just quickly how, how this operator works. So suppose that I have this function on the vertices uh, and I take the boundary, co-boundary co operator, what it will do, it will sum up the values on each face. So, um, Uh, it will take the sum or the difference. So uh, here, for example, I take one plus one. So the value on the edge will be zero. It will be zero. Here, it's one plus zero. The value is going to be one. Here, it's going to be one, zero, and one. Okay. So I'm taking the difference between the values on the vertices or the sum because we're working with Z mod two. It's the same. So this is the operation that we call delta zero. And in a way, it looks like some kind of a derivative, right? We look at every edge and we ask whether the value has changed or not. If it changed, then we're gonna place a one. If it didn't change, then it's gonna be a zero. So um, we will think about this operator as some kind of a derivative. Okay, so in instead of simplexes and functions, now we're gonna think about, sorry, simplexes and the boundary. Now we're gonna think about uh, functions and the derivatives 
Uh, and you can keep doing the same thing. Now you have a function on the edges. You can take again sort of the boundary, the co-boundary operation on that, which will be for every simplex, sum up the values on its boundary. So we only have one simplex here and the sum of the values on its boundary is one plus one plus zero, which is zero. So then that will give us a function which is zero on this simplex and that's it because we don't have any other simplexes. So this is the co-boundary of dimension one for this function. So it gives us a way to move from function on vertices to function on edges to function on simplexes. And very much like I showed you in the example before, when I take this operation and apply it twice in a row, so I start with a function here on the vertices, I end up with a function here on the faces, which is always going to be zero. So it's not a coincidence that it happened here. Okay? And this is written here. So if I apply it twice, I always get the zero function. Sorry? Yes. Can I ask you a question? The, how you, did you put the, the first numbers in the, in the, just to understand the mechanism? How, how did you put the first numbers in the, in the first graph in the vertices? Ah, this is just a function. I, I chose the function and I showed you what, ah, what okay. the co-boundary co of it. Yeah, yeah, it's an example. Okay. okay. Um, now we're gonna do the same definition as before. ZK, but the superscript is the kernel of this operator. It's called the K cycles. And the way to think about it is, at least in two dimensional calculus, you can think of it as a function whose uh, curl operator is zero, right? Uh, what we do here, we take the sum, sort of the derivative uh, along a closed loop, uh, so that's an, an intuitive way maybe to think about it. And BK would be the image of delta K minus one, which we call the K co-boundaries. And those are, again, if you think about derivatives, then those are functions that have a potential. So they are the derivative of something else. And in cohomology, we want to differentiate between functions that uh, have zero derivative and functions that have potential in a way. And if you remember from calculus, when you have zero derivative, but no potential, that's when holes show up or spaces are not simply connected. Uh, and this is the, what we do for the definition of the cohomology. So it's the same definition, just with the cosec and the co-boundaries. And, and as I stated before, we'll think about it as uh, functions whose derivative is zero, but they have no potential. Uh, so these are, the two, this is homology and cohomology. One studies lists of simplexes, the other studies functions on simplexes. Uh, but at least in the way I describe it, you can use linear algebra to show that the dimension of H super K or sub K is the same. And it, this is what I call beta K. Uh, so basically they measure the same thing, but in a different way. Um, <laughs> maybe, uh, how much time do I have? Sorry. Roughly five more minutes, five, six. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly go through the example. Uh, I'll leave you the slide so you can look at it later. Uh, but basically uh, you'll have to trust me on this one because I wanna get to the definition of the model. But if I take the same example as before, okay. And I wanna calculate now the cohomology. So the zeroth cohomology is gonna be, gen gonna be the space of all constant function or piecewise constant functions on the vertices very much like I, the example I started on the graph. And you can just calculate the kernels and the images to show that. And here, this, in this example, the space is one dimensional because there's only, the all one function is the only piecewise constant non-zero function. Uh, so therefore the dimension is one. Uh, in dimension one, it's a little bit less intuitive. So for example, what you can show is that age, the cohomology in dimension one is, also has one non-trivial element but for example, here, the function you can choose to be a um, non-trivial co-cycle is one here and zero everywhere else, okay? Uh, why is this thing a co-cycle? Well, a co-cycle needs to have a zero co-boundary. And what is a zero co-boundary? Basically, I need to, to sum up the values along each simplex. So if I sum up the values here, and I'm the only simplex I have, then the value that I get is zero, okay? The one here, that I have here doesn't add up to anything because it's not on the boundary of any simplex. So this thing is indeed a co-cycle, right? It's co-boundary is zero. And you can show that it's not a co-boundary. It's a little bit, it's not very complicated, but uh, again, uh, it's a matter of linear algebra. So I'll leave it for now. But the point is that uh, you get at the end of the day, this, 
uh, these two objects measure the same thing. They give you the same dimension, but one looks at function and the other looks at the list of simplexes. Um, one more interesting example uh, is the torus. And we're gonna talk about the torus uh, in the third talk as well. So here, what I show you is a um, uh, triangulation of the torus made of uh, uh, nine vertices. Well, basically I identify these two points together. This is the same vertex. And this is the same vertex and so on. So I glue, I take the square and I glue the sides together. And what you can show here again, you do the same linear algebra. Uh, you can show that H0 has one element. So it's, there's one component. H1 now uh, will consist of two cycles. Um, one will be this path because it wraps around and come back to the same point. And this is gonna be another cycle. Um, and if you think about the original shape, Right. This is one loop that you have, and there's going to be another loop over here. So here, this is an example where we have a homology which has dimension two. Okay. Oh, sorry. So the Betty numbers of the torus are one, two, and one. Uh, so in this example, we also have a two-dimensional uh, homology. Namely, if you think about the torus here, there is an air pocket uh, contained inside the torus, and if you take all the faces, um, if you take all the faces here, all the triangles, then that's gonna be a two dimensional cycle. It's a list of simplexes in dimension two that has no boundary. And that basically what gives you uh, this air pocket inside the torus. So um, sorry for going a bit fast, but this is basically what homology measure, components, loops, air pockets, and similar things in higher dimensions. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I skip that because I don't think it's okay. So the last thing I want to tell you is as a preparation for the next talk is what are the two models that we're going to focus on? Uh, uh, so basically, again, we want to take random graphs, look at some generalization of those in higher dimension and study this homology that I just told you about. So the first model is called uh, the D dimensional D, D random D complex or the linear Michelin complex, which is a generalization of the Erdős and graph. So in the Erdős and graph, we have n vertices and we add the edges independently. You can do the same thing in dimension two by taking first n vertices, add all the possible edges inside already, and then make the triangles be independent with probability p, and that will be called x two. Uh, but generally, you can do that in any dimension you want. What you do is you take a complete D minus one dimension skeleton. So we take vertices, edges, triangles, and so on up to a fixed dimension. And then you make the D simplexes be random with probability P and independently. And uh, this is what we're gonna call XD. Okay. Um, and when you define this complex this way, you can see that the GNP is just a special case. It's just X1 and P where you take and vertices and the edges are random. Uh, so this is the first model that we're gonna focus on. Here is a picture of how this thing looks like. Um, so this is in dimension, this is a two dimensional complex. So we start with all the vertices and all the edges. This is with probability zero. And then when you increase the probability, we basically add more and more triangles to this structure. Uh, when we do that, then the, hom the homology that I described to you before is gonna be random. For example, here, there are many, many holes, many closed loops, but some of them are gonna be filled in by the random triangles. Uh, and also the triangles can form those air pockets as well. So we have two uh, degrees of homology that can be random in dimension D in the top dimension in, in the core dimension one. And this is what we want, to, we want to study with respect to this complex. And that's going to be the topic of tomorrow's talk. Uh, so this is one model extending the addition Rennie, and this is probably the most well studied model so far. The other one is a geometric model. Um, which uh, is defined as follows. So uh, before the randomness, uh, what we define is something called the check complex. We start with some uh, finite set of points in some metric space. We draw balls around the points and then the complex will be built uh, using intersections of the balls. So uh, I'm gonna look at balls of radius uh, R over two. And then whenever two balls intersect, I'm gonna place the corresponding edge whenever I have an intersection between the balls. And if three balls intersect like here, 
then I'm going to add a two dimensional simplex over. Uh, these three balls do not intersect, and therefore this triangle is left empty. And then I get this uh, simplicial complex that I call the check complex. Uh, one key property of this complex is that uh, those two objects, the random balls, oh, sorry, the balls on the left and the complex on the right, they have the same homology, the same structure I described to you before. And you can see, for example, here that in terms of homology, both the shape on the left and on the right, they both have one component that's beta zero, and they also have one hole, which what I call beta one. Right? There is a hole here in the ball, and there is a hole here in the complex. And this is very useful when you're going to do prob probability on that because it, we can switch back and forth between combinatorics on the left and stochastic geometry on the right. Uh, okay, I think this is, yeah, uh, I'm almost done. So uh, we're going to study it in a special case where the point process is going to be a Poisson process, as I mentioned before, but specifically on the on a flat torus. Basically, I'm taking a, a d-dimensional cube and I glue the opposite sides. So I get this periodic box. So if the ball is placed here, it's going to come back from the other side. Uh, the main reason is just uh, the results are more elegant this way uh, because everything is Euclidean. Uh, it doesn't have a boundary, so the space is homogeneous in a way. And also in terms of homology, uh, this torus has homology in all possible degrees and non-trivial one. It's always a G choose K number of cycles. Um, okay, so we're gonna generate a Poisson process on this torus, homogeneous with rate N. Uh, we're gonna build the check complex, this thing from the random points. Uh, and notice that the one dimensional skeleton of this object is the geometric graph that I showed you before. So it's a generalization of the random geometric graph. So this is the second object we're going to focus on, and this is going to come in the third talk uh, on uh, on Wednesday. Uh, okay, I just finished here. There are, these are, I think, the two models that have been um, uh, most well studied um, in this theory of random substitution complex, and they sort of come from different areas. One is geometric, the other is combinatoric. Uh, there are other models that have been studied. Uh, they are listed here. Uh, other generalization of the GNP model, there's a generalization for uh, random regular graphs, uh, but models are still coming up and this field is relatively uh, young. And so there's still room for many other models to show up. Um, yeah, sorry that I had to rush, but uh, again, I'll put the, the slide so you can uh, review the definition, but tomorrow uh, we're gonna dedicate the talk to this random D complex, the generalization of the Erdős and Rennie graph. And I'm gonna tell you I'll give you some review about the, the results known about the homology of this complex and how it connects to what is known about the, the Erdős-Rennie graph. Uh, okay, so that's it for now. Thank you.